I just completed a four panel mosaic of a veil nebula totaling 86 hours of integration time. Hi everybody and welcome back to the channel. Well, I thought today I would share with you an image that I did of the Veil Nebula. And uh, as I said at the beginning, it's a four panel mosaic, uh, which was needed because I was using the rig in Spain and it's got the Stellar Mirror 90 millimeter refractor on it with a focal length of 540 millimeters and the ASI 2600 mm Pro on the back. And in order to get well, to be honest with you, not the entire thing, but most of it in, um, I needed the, to do the four panels. Now, um, I thought about imaging it ahead from here at home, but it does not get particularly high in our night sky. If we have a look in Telescopius, uh, you can see from where I am, it only gets to about 22 degrees elevation, and it's to the north, which is uh, my, my worst view, to be honest. So it wasn't really going to be an option here. Plus, I didn't have any rig set up that was wide enough to actually capture the whole thing even in one frame. I mean trying to do a mosaic with this degree of elevation and also with the, the small number of clear skies we get here uh, was not going to be a goer. Whereas if we have a look here and I flick this to Spain, suddenly you can see we're up at 84 degrees and lots of time for imaging. So Spain seemed like the logical place to do this project. And looking in Stellarium, uh, from the point of view of being in Spain, you can see it has a really nice elevation above the horizon. And if we just zoom in, uh, here is the Veil Nebula here. And if I turn on the constellations, you can see, I'll just move back a bit, that it is in the uh, constellation of Cygnus, which is the Swan. Now, finding some uh, consistent information about the Veil Nebula with regards to its age and its distance from Earth, it's kind of difficult because if you search, you'll see a, a, quite a range of numbers quoted. Um, I think originally they thought it was around 1,400 to 1,700 light years away from Earth, but um, my understanding is that more accurate measurements have put it at 2,400 to 2,600 light years away. Now, with regards to its age, um, I've seen commonly it quoted as having a um, developed 8,000 years ago when the star exploded that produced it. Um, but I have seen sort of five to 8,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago, and even 25,000 years ago. So yeah, there's a lot of variation in the in information out there, but um, I guess roughly around about 8,000 years ago, they think this, this occurred. However, more consistently, people are quoting the size of the Veil Nebula as being about 120 light years across or six full moons. So it's a nice decent sized object to image. Now this next bit of information I got from Wikipedia. Now when a, a star explodes, uh, forms a, a supernova remnant, there's usually some sort of compact stellar remnant left behind, whether it be a neutron star or a black hole, depending on you know the size of the original star. And it's been estimated that the star that exploded to produce the Veil Nebula was about 15 to 20 solar masses. And so they thought it would put it more in the neutron star um, remnant range. So my understanding is at the moment they haven't found a compact remnant um, that explains the Veil Nebula. But I guess, you know, the search continues. Now here's a screen grab of an image I got off the Wikipedia, just showing sort of the various individual components of the Veil Nebula that are often imaged separately because of the fact that this object is quite large. So we've got the Western Veil over here, which, you know, contains the um, Witch's Broom. And we've got Pickering's Triangle here, and then the Eastern Veil over here. And uh, if you're lucky enough to get time to do a mosaic or have a wide field, um, more wide field telescope set up, then you can capture the whole thing as one, which is what my plan was. Although, unfortunately, I could, sort of couldn't fit in this area down here and it was perhaps a little bit chopped off the top here. But I was still pleased with the amount that I managed to capture. OK, so let's jump into Pixinsight Sight and have a look at what uh, I captured. I'm going to roughly run through some of the steps of the mosaic process. It's been a while since I've done one. The last time I did it, I used AstroPixel processor. This time I wanted to do it entirely through Pixinsight. So I actually um, used Frank's video, that's City Astro, um, as a reference because he's got a great video running through how to produce a mosaic. So I'll put a link in the description below so you can have a look at that. 
Uh, but I'll just sort of point out some of the issues I had while I was trying to process uh, this mosaic. Up here, I've got my um, the, the panels that I captured. So this was the um, HA panel one, panel two, panel three, and panel four. Now these were pretty similar in total integration time for each panel. Uh, they varied from 10.6 to 12.1 hours. Now with the oxygen three um, and with uh, obviously uh, the moon being a factor often, uh, there was a little less time spent capturing uh, these panels. Not too much less, but this is panel one, panel two, panel three, and panel four. And these varied from uh, 8.3 hours to 9.6 hours. So, you know, f not far off the number of hours for the HA panels. And again, um, fairly consistent in the integration time. Now, the first step is to get rid of the gradient in all your panels. Now, the first time I went through this, I used, if we go to um, process all processes and there's gradient correction, which is what I'm sort of commonly commonly using in my processing. It's you know it's maybe the more lazy approach, but it seems to give a reasonable result. The problem was when I went through this and did the whole mosaic process, um, I did not end up with a very even mosaic. Um, gradients between the panels and differences were quite obvious. So I went back and I did my gradient correction using Graxberg. And uh, that worked really well. So um, if I'm doing a mosaic in the future, I'll be using Graxpert as my um, way of getting rid of the gradients. So the next thing that we have to do is go into scripts and uh, where are we? mosaic and mosaic by coordinates. And um, here is where you'll either choose sort of add windows that are on the screen already or add files from a directory. If you're adding files, um, you do want to um, specify an output directory. If you're just, uh, you know, inputting various windows from here, then um, you will just get the windows popping up here and they won't be saved to a directory. The other thing that's important and that Frank points out as well is that you need to have uh, valid astrometric solutions for each of the panels. So if you haven't got that, you need to go ahead and do that before you run this um, process. Um, now, as far as the projection here, um, there are different ones here. I don't know all the details about the best ones to use. I used genomic based on what Frank had suggested, and that seemed to work really well. So I ran that, and um, you basically end up with these um, panels like this, and they're all sort of separated out with the black space where the other panels will be. So that was the result basically for the HA and very similar to the O3. The next one thing you want to do is kind of like a linear fit, but you can't just use the ordinary linear fit here in processes. Um, you can't use that one. The reason being, my understanding is because of all this sort of black space around here. So you need to use a script called DNA uh, linear fit. So if you go down to scripts, utilities, and at the bottom DNA linear fit, I'll Oops, I've got to have a valid um, window open, so it'll open it up just a minute. Uh, utilities and back down to here. And um, I'll leave a link in the description below as to where you can get that. But basically, this is it here. You choose your panel to be your reference and then your target view, and you run that for each of the other three panels for O3. And then you choose a target, uh, a sort of a reference one for the HA, and then you do, you know, apply it to the other three um, panels so that you get a nice DNA linear fit produced. So once we've done that, we move on to the gradient merge mosaic um, process. So under processes, you'll find gradient, uh, where are we? Gradient merge mosaic here, which I've um, got open here. Now um, you put in all your, your panels, you add the files from your saved saved panels after you've done the other two steps that I've shown you. And um, there's some settings down here. Now there's average and overlay. I don't know fully the details, difference between them. Uh, in Frank's video, he used average, so that's what I did. There's these two settings here, which are different um, when you just use the default. So shrink radius, um, I understand again from Frank's video, is it's the amount that it sort of shrinks the edge uh, of the panel, so you get rid of any edge effects when you're blending them. And feather radius is sort of how 
well it blends the panels together at the edges and deals with sort of things or make sure you don't end up with things like pinch stars etc now if i just click here and, and do the default you'll get shrink radius of one and a feather radius of 10. now if i run that with the default settings uh, this is what I ended up with for the HA. It looks like a pretty good result, but then you have a look down here and you can see that there is a, a sort of an artifact here and some of the blending's not brilliant through here. If you actually use the settings that um, were suggested by Frank at 5 and 75, uh, you end up with this result, which actually looks very, very clean. And that problem that was over here has gone and the blending looks a lot better. There is a slight difference in the noise between this panel and this panel, but uh, otherwise it looks like a pretty good mosaic now. I was pretty pleased with that. That was the mosaic for the uh, HA and that's for the O3. Then it was a matter uh, of going ahead and processing it. And I wanted to remove the stars and, you know, work on the actual starless versions uh, to you know away from the stars and add the stars in later the problem is that when you're dealing with nebulae that have very fine filaments like the veil nebula has an abundance of there are issues with star exterminator when it removes the stars it'll off, often take out some of the filaments uh, which you actually wanted to keep you know this isn't so much of a problem when you are dealing with Nebula, nebula targets that don't have fine filaments uh, that you don't seem to notice any loss from star exterminator but certainly with these filaments and i've shown in a previous video where i did these sort of the mermaid nebula um, you know i was losing quite a lot if i used star exterminator the alternative is to use starnet 2 but the problem with starnet 2 is uh, it makes it leaves behind much more of a messy background to have to deal with, but it does treat the, the filaments a lot better. So I'm just going to show you the examples here. It wasn't so obvious with the Oxygen 3, but I think I'll demonstrate it best with the Hydrogen Alpha. Now, if you look at this result here with Star Exterminator, you know, you look at it and you go, that's a pretty good result. Quite happy with that. And you go ahead and process it. The only thing is that when you stop and actually have a very critical look, you can see that there are uh, nice bits of the filamentous stuff missing. It's just been completely removed. If I take that and put it onto the one that was produced by Starnet, you can see here it is nicely, it's nicely preserved. It hasn't been removed. But if you look here, there's a nice clean background to deal with. And over here is quite a messy background. So, you know, caught a little bit a rock between a rock and a hard place here. If I just come down to some more examples uh, where are we here? Um, let's just zoom this in over here like this. And uh, again, you can see this comes up and there seems to be a bit of a break and stuff missing. Whereas here, there's this nice filament detail which has actually been removed by Star Exterminator here. And that's seen quite often. There's bits here are, are gone in Star Exterminator. This bit here is completely gone in Star Exterminator. So, um, you know, what do you do? Well, what I actually did was I produced, uh, saved TIFF versions of um, both of these because I wanted to sort of the background of Star Exterminator, but I wanted to preserve the lost areas of nebulosity from uh, the depression in Starnet 2. So I did a couple of layers. I had my base layer as being Star Exterminator, and then I put... Uh, Starnet layer over the top and then I sort of painstakingly went through and uh, just with the, the, the paint tool and a mask um, put these areas back in so it, it's basically a blend of these two images with the small areas of um, Starnet 2 showing through um, in these areas that are missing in Star Exterminator and ending up with the best of both worlds. I got all the nebulosity kept by Starnet 2 and I got all the nice clean background of Star Exterminator. And this is the result of combining those two versions together. It was a bit of painstaking time going through, sort of going backwards and forwards between the two versions, seeing what was missing and what needed to be blended in from Starnet 2 into Starnet Exterminator. But in the end, I, I think I got managed to get everything. So then I went ahead and processed it further um, and uh, combined 
the HA and the O3 filters as an HOO image. I didn't capture any S2. You can capture S2. There is information to be had with the S2, but I decided just to do with the just to do an HOO and then process the stars separately. You know, there was a really nice detail that I was getting here, um, particularly this these areas of HA right around the outside. And you can see the various components of which is broom here. Also, you know, importantly, these areas here, which are really nice filamentous details I showed you in the Starnet and Star Exterminator versions. If I just did Star Exterminator, this wouldn't be here. Uh, you know, it was completely gone. So there's, there's quite a lot. If you can spend some time just going through and seeing what's missing out of your Star Exterminator versions and add those back in from a Starnet 2 version, you can get the full gamut of the... Um, of the filament, filamentous material in this amazing looking object. So I'll leave you with the final image. As I said, it was a four panel mosaic. It was 86 hours in total integration, which I was able to do from Spain because they have a lot more clear lights than we do here. And yeah, look, hopefully you find something useful in that, uh, in that video. Um, as I said, you know, keep a good closer eye on your nebulosity when you're removing the stars with Star Exterminator particularly if there's fine filamentous detail that you want to preserve. You won't notice it, and you know, if you're doing the Pelican Nebula and things like that, you won't notice any difference. It's not really removing anything, but it's that fine filaments that uh, often go missing, and you may not realize it's gone, uh, and you finish your image, and then you find it later. So uh, keep that in mind, and uh, look, until next time, I hope everybody's getting lots and lots of clear skies.